Welcome to an episode of r slash malicious compliance, where we share stories of people conforming to the letter, but not the spirit of a request. Sit back and enjoy these stories. And at the end of this video, make sure to like and comment and definitely subscribe if you have not already done so. Enjoy. And this next story is posted by you slash G day. How you going? Beating the system by adhering to the rules. Many years ago, I had a job which permitted me to travel around the world a fair amount. Travel? Hey, remember that? But I digress. As part of that travel, I thought it was wise to join a few frequent flyer and hotel rewards type schemes. I had little control over my travel plans and frequently would use different airlines and stay in different hotels. Whatever was cheapest was the rule. Anyway, the time came when I was lucky enough to be booked into one of the really big name hotel groups, so naturally I wanted to make sure I was enrolled in their reward scheme to start collecting nights and some sort of status points. Unfortunately, the online sign up had a slight glitch. Even though I had definitely filled out my details correctly and even had a welcome email summarizing as much, Something went amiss in their database and my surname was registered as both my first name and my surname. So after that initial welcome email, every other greeting or communication was addressed to Mr. Surname Surname. Annoying, but eh, I felt I could live with it. As luck would have it, I ended up being able to stay in hotels owned by this hotel group a couple of times. And even though my status was equivalent to medieval surf, I decided that it was time to correct the mistake that had been in place for a couple of years. I found the contact number for members, provided my membership number, and explained the problem. I asked quite simply, can you fix my first name to be my actual first name, not the glitch that it is now? After a long pause, I was told, no, that is a name change and we would need to see a copy of your passport or driver's license to verify the change of your name. Well, that wasn't going to happen. Never mind the fact that I don't drive, I wasn't about to email their request, my passport image to them to fix this. Isn't there anything you can do? I mean, this is such an obvious error. We're only permitted to make minor corrections to names, such as a misspelling, and at maximum a two-letter variation. And with that, I hung up and developed a convoluted plan. Starting the next day, and for the next few weeks thereafter, I will call up the hotel membership team tell them there was a minor misspelling on my first name and ask them to make a correction on one, perhaps two letters. Actually, there is no N in my first name. Can you remove it? Yes, the C is silent, but it is there. Can you please add it? It is not Y, it is I, and so on and so forth. I made only the most subtle of changes with each call, and thankfully none of the agents I spoke to had ever helped me before. Hooray for large outsourced call centers. It took about eight or nine calls, but eventually I was properly me again. An amusing side effect of these changes is that whenever you make a spelling correction, it reissues membership cards to members, you know, to be nice. For a long time, I had a stack of various bizarre spellings of my name on little plastic cards from this hotel. Every now and again, when checking in, I present one or more of these unusual variations and the staff at check-in would be rather perplexed. I'd summarize the story and the sympathetic laughs would occasionally result in a room upgrade or other minor perk. Not nearly as impactful as many of the other events recounted in this community, but it amused me greatly at the time. And this story is posted by youth slash ghetto ceratops. You can take calls, but it will be for the whole class to hear. Back in my college days, I was taking an ancient history class with a notoriously grouchy professor that we would just call Prof. He was super old school and a ripe sack of horse apples. He hated technology and insisted on using an analog projector with actual film slides because they were more reliable, despite the fact that he regularly had to replace the bulbs, sometimes in the middle of a lecture. Just so you can understand how awful this guy was, we once had to write a three-page essay on why a certain breed of ancient dogs, I think it was a Basenji, were the superior breed of canine. Oh, and he just so happened to have two Basenjis. We literally were writing papers on why his dogs were cool and why he was so cool for owning them. 
Anyway, that butt hat was a creep, and he hated phone calls in his class, particularly texting. We had to physically turn off our phones in front of him unless it was an absolute emergency. And even then, it had to be a phone call as, again, he had a righteous fury reserved for texts. It was tornado season in my state, and we had several tornado warnings for the area. At the time, I was engaged, and I had a lot of friends and future-in-laws in the area. So, before class, I told several of them to call or text me when their area was safe just for my own peace of mind. No biggie. I honestly thought Pruff wouldn't have an issue with me keeping my phone on since, you know, massive, mobile, swirling, natural disasters were roaming the city. I should have never doubted the depths of his sliminess, but he should have never doubted the depths of my pettiness. I told him that I had family and a fiancé and asked if I could keep my phone on my desk just in case. He has this awful goblin-esque scowl on his face and says, If you want to take calls during the lecture and interrupt my class, you can do it for the whole class to hear. By this, he means speakerphone. He had said the same thing before the other people and most of them just turned off their phones. I'm a boat rocker though. I'll stir a pot of shite like my life depends on it. Naturally, I cheerily agree and thank him profusely as I text several friends before class begins, telling them to call me at certain times with the most ridiculous emergencies they can conceive, but keep them plausible. We aren't five minutes into the lecture before I get a call from my cousin. As the ringtone cuts through the classroom, the professor rolls his eyes and gestures for me to answer it. The nader sucked up the entire chicken coop, says a voice in quivering tones as if the caller is on the brink of tears. I finish the call and wish him and his fictional farm well. Ten minutes pass and I get another call from a friend. The results just came in. It's definitely erectile dysfunction. Emphasis on defunction. Brownie points to him for getting creative. I don't think the professor could hear the contents of the calls from his podium, but the surrounding students could, which results in either faces of pure confusion or holding back cackles. Another call like this rings in, and I am told to take any future calls out in the hallway. I spend essentially the entire period sitting down at my desk, getting a call, walking out in the hallway, consoling the caller for whatever absurd malady has befallen them, and walking back to my desk. Luckily, I always sat right next to the door. I don't think I could have gotten away with this if I had to walk across the entire classroom. Afterwards, Pruff let us keep our phones on our desk to check them for emergencies. We still couldn't text, but it was a step in the right direction. And this story is posted by you slash DXMXMLXX. Decide I probably don't speak English well enough? All right, I don't speak it at all. When I was seven, my family moved from Reykjavik, Iceland to London, UK, for my father's work. He was an Icelandic native, but my mother was born in England, so I was raised completely bilingual from birth. It's also not uncommon for Icelanders to speak English and often other languages too. I also spoke passable Danish at this point. At my primary school, basically elementary school, goes up to age 11, they put me in regular classes because I spoke English as well as someone raised in the UK. But at my secondary school, 11 to 16, all immigrant kids got put in ESL, English as a Second Language, sessions. You can earn your way out of these extra classes by completing the evaluations and an exam, but the fact that I had to do these extra assignments and go to these classes at all pissed me off. My brother had just gone through them when he went two years before me and been allowed to stop going after a month when he completed all of the set work. But I didn't want a month of extra classes and extra work. And the ESL tutor who ran the classes when he had them had left. So the new teacher didn't know him and therefore didn't know me either. The school decided I didn't speak proper English. So I didn't. The ESL tutor didn't speak Icelandic and through the work I was given was mind-numbling easy. Think how they teach phonetics and basic sentence structure to four-year-olds. I stuck to my pretense of not speaking a single word of English in those classes for two full weeks in protest. In my third week, my history teacher assigned us homework, which I didn't feel like doing. And since my ESL teacher had put a note in my file that I wasn't fluent enough to be given homework, I decided to refer my history teacher to that and tell him in fluent, unaccented English that I don't speak the language well enough to complete homework, according to Miss ESL Tutor. Luckily enough, he found this incredibly funny and didn't punish me since I was right. My file did say that. When my ESL teacher found out, she gave me a detention and yelled at me for using ESL to get out of work and for wasting her time. 
So I agreed. Having me in ESL was a waste of time, and that must mean I didn't have to go anymore. She tried to argue, but I had my history teacher on my side, and he managed to convince the school office to change ESL into an opt-in class for people whose parents and teachers felt needed it. I didn't have to go back to ESL and didn't even have to complete that homework. And this story is posted by you slash Trexmoflex. My friend is a manager for Costco at the membership and returns counter. Costco has a pretty relaxed return policy, so 99% of the time, customers bring things in to return or exchange. My friend says it's no questions asked. But if on the computer system he notices in someone's transaction history that they're abusing the system, he'll deny the return and offer a pretty clear explanation as to why. Honestly, most people don't raise a big stink. The evidence is pretty clear, and they say, okay, I didn't know that's how it worked, and go on with their lives. But last week, a customer was getting upset that my friend wasn't going to do a return even though there was a long list of transactions that made it pretty obvious this guy was routinely buying things, using them a few times as needed, then returning them. In this case, he had brought a bunch of food and was trying to return the packaging for full returns. He's not backing down. My friend has the full authority to cancel a membership, and this comes with a refund most of the time. So he tells the guy, sir... It doesn't seem like you're happy with our products and services. I'm going to go ahead and cancel your membership and give you a full refund of the annual fee. The guy, immediately understanding that this means he won't be allowed back in a Costco, sits kind of stunned for a few seconds, then gets real panicky like, no, 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 I'm good, please don't do that. My friend isn't backing down, so the guy asks to speak to a manager. Friend plays the whole, I am the manager of this department, so the guy escalates. The assistant warehouse manager comes over and looks at the transaction history and immediately sides with my friend, saying virtually the same thing but in a super sing-songy, we're so sorry you haven't been happy with the products we sell, and backs my friend up while he finishes canceling the guy's membership. These were four great stories, so we definitely thank you for listening. And do us a huge favor, comment, like, share, and definitely subscribe for sure so you'll be able to get more of the reminders for new videos that come out in the future. Have yourselves an incredible day. This has been TNA Top Notch Audio.